Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Welcome to Target Prelims 2021. This is the third and final session for international relations under our prelims crash course. In these three classes, I've tried to cover around 120 topics from current affairs of the last one year by using practice questions. We have covered, we are trying to cover at least around 85 to 90 practice questions. So if the prelims is current affairs oriented, whatever we have discussed is going to be immensely helpful. So if you have found these videos to be useful, if you have found the crash course to be useful, do let us know in the comment section below. Do like the videos, share them and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. So let's start with the first question for today. The first question for today is related to the Financial Action Task Force or the FATF. The FATF was established by the G7, the UN General Assembly, the OECD or the IMF. So what's the correct answer? The correct answer is option A, G7. It was the G7 group which established the FATF or the Financial Action Task Force. I have taken this as the first question because yesterday we ended the session with a discussion on the G7 grouping. So I thought I would take something related to it, something which is very important and relevant for our prelims exam. So let's talk about the FATF. See the Financial Action Task Force is an intergovernmental body. It's an intergovernmental body which was established in 1989 by the G7 countries. The primary objective of the FATF was to counter money laundering. When the FATF was set up in 1989, its primary objective was to counter money laundering. Later, after the 9-11 attacks, a clear link was established between money laundering and terrorist financing. So after the 9-11 attacks, the FATF's mandate was updated. It was given a second task, a second role as well, which was to counter terrorist financing. So these are the two primary objectives of the FATF. It's an intergovernmental body which has been set up by the G7 to counter money laundering, to take anti-money laundering measures and to counter terrorist financing. This group consists of 39 members. There are 39 members which includes 37 countries and two regional organizations or regional groupings. That includes the Gulf Cooperation Council or the GCC and the European Union. These two regional groupings are a part of it along with 37 member states. But FATF has global jurisdiction. See, the, in this map, you can see the member states of FATF which includes India as well. But apart from these 39 jurisdictions, almost 200 jurisdictions are also covered by the FATF. That's because the FATF has led to the establishment of regional FATF styled bodies across different parts of the world. There are nine such FATF styled regional bodies which enable the FATF to achieve its objectives. Okay, there are nine region based FATF styled regional bodies. India belongs to the Asia Pacific group and India is a member of this FATF styled body as well. So this gives FATF jurisdiction over 200 territories around the world. Is that clear? So what FATF does is that it is essentially a policy making body. It comes out with standards. It comes out with policy measures and recommendations to counter money laundering and terrorist financing. These standards that would be prescribed by the FATF, they will have to be adopted by the respective countries in their national laws. For example, India has abided by the FATF standards by enacting the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which specifically deals with money laundering. Right? We have adopted all the recommendations, the measures as prescribed by the FATF. Then to counter terrorist financing, we have amended the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is India's primary legal weapon against terrorism. 
so it also deals with terror financing as well so through such national legislations the member countries and the jurisdictions are expected to abide by the fatf standards is that clear so this topic is primarily in news because pakistan has been placed on the gray list of fatf that is why the topic is important in fact india has used the fatf platform very proactively to target pakistan and it's a part of india's course of diplomacy to put pressure on pakistan for sponsoring terrorism against india india works with other like minded countries like the us france and the others and we have tried to bring economic pressure on pakistan by getting it gray listed at the fatf see the fatf has the powers to conduct a periodic review of the jurisdictions around the world through this review fatf can check whether the countries are abiding by these standards are they really working towards countering money laundering and terror financing if there are any deficiencies in their laws in their legal measures then the fatf can take action against those countries it can either place a country on a gray list it can declare that country as a high risk jurisdiction and place it on the gray list placing a country on a gray list is like a warning it's like a notice after this the country would be given a action plan which it has to implement specific measures corrective measures would be recommended by the fatf and they will have to be implemented by the country which has been gray listed even after this if the country is deliberately violating the fatf standards then fatf can choose to blacklist the country it can declare the jurisdiction as a non cooperative jurisdiction and place it on the so called blacklist if a country is blacklisted or even when it is on the gray list there are going to be serious economic consequences see for example pakistan has been on the gray list three times in the last 12 to 13 years first time it was gray listed in 2008 following the 2611 attacks it remained on the list until 2009 it was brought back on the gray list in 2012 and remained on the list until 2015 now recently in 2018 again pakistan has been gray listed and it continues to remain on the gray list even today so because of being gray listed pakistan has suffered severe economic consequences according to a recent report around 38 billion dollars is the loss incurred by pakistan because of gray listing if a country gets black listed the consequences are going to be even more severe this will invite economic sanctions this will lead global financial institutions like world bank and imf to stop providing loans and assistance to such countries it will result in a downgrade of the sovereign credit rating of the country it will drive away private companies and investors and no investor is going to put their money in such countries so getting blacklisted will have severe economic consequences even being on the gray list has a few economic consequences as of now only two countries have been blacklisted one is iran and the other is north korea okay so these two countries are on the blacklist and pakistan continues to remain on the gray list so these are the important facts and the important points that you need to know about the financial action task force now let's move on to the second question which of the following group of countries have the observer status at the shanghai cooperation organization or also known as the sco is it india pakistan iran afghanistan iran afghanistan belarus mongolia india turkey usa japan pakistan sri lanka nepal and afghanistan so what's the correct answer to answer the question we need to talk about the sco or the shanghai cooperation organization the sco is a very important regional grouping that's primarily focused on the central asia region this grouping was formed back in 1996 and it was known as the shanghai 5 because it included only 5 countries back then 
the members were Russia, China, Kazakhstan, then Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. These five countries from the Central Asia region had formed the Shanghai Five. The grouping was led by China and Russia and later in 2001, Uzbekistan was also brought into the group. So with the inclusion of Uzbekistan, the Shanghai Five group was renamed as the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This is a very important regional grouping that is focused on the political, economic and strategic security of the Central Asia region. It promotes political relations amongst the members, promotes trade and economy, provides for the exploitation of Central Asian resources. The grouping is also focused on connectivity projects. It also deals with security and strategic related issues of the region. In 2017, at the Astana summit, which was held in Kazakhstan, the membership of SCO was expanded. In a very big development, India and Pakistan were admitted as members of the SCO. Before 2017, India and Pakistan were also observer states. They didn't have full membership. But in 2017, at the Astana summit, the membership was expanded and India and Pakistan were also brought on board this organization. So these are the eight member countries of SCO. The SCO is a very, very important group because it is said that SCO is the best platform to help stabilize Afghanistan. It is said SCO is the best platform to deal with terrorism and radicalism, which affects South Asia, West Asia and Central Asia. That's because under the SCO, there is a platform known as RATS, R-A-T-S. It stands for Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure. I'll repeat, R-A-T-S stands for Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure. This is a key platform of the SEO that focuses on counter-terrorism and de-radicalization. Because this region is severely affected by terrorism and extremism, which emanates from the Afghanistan-Pakistan belt. Many Central Asian countries, then even India, Iran, right? And of course, Afghanistan, Pakistan themselves, they are all severely affected by terrorism and extremism that is found in this region around the Afghanistan-Pakistan belt. So SEO is said to be the best platform to deal with terrorism and radicalism in the region. Right? That's why SEO is an important grouping for India. So which are the observer states of this grouping? Afghanistan, Belarus, Iran and Mongolia. Please remember this. The topic is also in news because it has been recently reported just a few weeks back that Iran might be admitted as a full-time member of the SCO. There are reports coming from Iran that Iran could be admitted as a full-time member very soon. The grouping also has a few dialogue partners like Armenia, Azerbaijan, Cambodia, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Turkey. So the composition, the membership of the group, the observer states, dialogue partners can be very important for your prelims exam. So now it's very easy to answer this question. The question is asking for the group of countries amongst the given options which have the observer status. Clearly the right answer is option B, Iran, Afghanistan, Belarus and Mongolia, right? So that is the correct answer. Now moving on, the next question, but it is related to something that we discussed in the previous question. Which Central Asian country has adopted permanent neutrality in geopolitics? This topic is also in news. And it's related to SEO that we just discussed. Is it Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan or Turkmenistan? The correct answer is option D. Turkmenistan has officially adopted a permanent neutrality position in geopolitics. In fact, even the United Nations has officially recognized this. This is a policy of Turkmenistan. It was adopted back in 1995 on the 12th of December. So according to this policy, Turkmenistan has committed itself to permanently remain neutral in geopolitics, meaning it will not take sides between two countries. It will not take sides in any war or in any conflict. If two countries are fighting against each other, 
Turkmenistan will not support one against the other. Right? Be it diplomatically or be it through military support. Turkmenistan will not extend any such support and it will firmly remain neutral in any geopolitical issue or even in the case of war and conflicts. So Turkmenistan will not even join any military clubs or military alliances. It will not join any power blocks which are designed to target a few countries. So that is the policy that Turkmenistan has adopted. It's because of this policy, Turkmenistan is not a member of the SCO. That's why this is related to what we discussed in the previous question. Turkmenistan hasn't joined the SCO because of this reason. It's the only Central Asian country which hasn't joined SCO. That's because it has a constitutional principle which commits the government towards permanent neutrality. Even the UN has recognized it. And in fact, the 12th of December is celebrated as a national holiday in Turkmenistan. And they have even built a massive monument in the country which marks the permanent neutrality position of Turkmenistan. Is that clear? This issue was recently in news because of the situation in Afghanistan. When the situation was deteriorating as the Taliban was taking over, several Afghan refugees, they fled into Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. But Turkmenistan didn't directly intervene because it has adopted the position of neutrality. Okay? This is also an opportunity look at, to look at the geography of the region, the neighboring countries and the neighboring geographical areas. It could be important for a map-based question. See, Turkmenistan borders the Caspian Sea. It shares borders with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Iran and Afghanistan. Okay? With Turkmenistan, we also have a very important project which is ongoing known as the Tapi Pipeline. It's a gas pipeline. It's, this project is even backed by the United States. Okay? Tapi Pipeline includes four countries. That is Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan and India. So through this project, we were planning to bring natural gas from Turkmenistan, which has very huge gas reserves. And through a gas pipeline, we were supposed to bring this to Afghanistan, Pakistan and India. The construction of the project was ongoing, but now the fate of the project is uncertain because of the current situation in Afghanistan. Okay? So these are some important prelims-based facts and geography-based facts about Turkmenistan which can be important for international relations. Now let's go to the next question. What are the primary objectives of OPEC and OPEC plus groupings? Reduce global oil prices, set oil production targets for its member nations, discourage oil consumption to tackle climate change, fix global demand for oil. To answer this, we need to understand what is OPEC and what is OPEC plus. What are these groups? What is their objective? See, OPEC stands for Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. This grouping was set up in 1960 through the Baghdad Conference. Is that clear? Five petroleum exporting countries came together to form the OPEC. The founding members include Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. These five countries, the five major oil exporting nations, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, they established the OPEC through the Baghdad conference. The grouping was set up mainly to protect the interests of the oil or the petroleum exporting nations. Over a period of time, the membership has expanded. At one point, there were 15 members, as you can see in this map. But the list I have given over here and in the side provides the current membership. Currently, there are 13 members, not 15. Because recently, Qatar quit the OPEC in 2019. Due to differences with Saudi Arabia, Qatar quit the OPEC grouping in 2019. Then last year, Ecuador, the South American country, Ecuador, also quit OPEC. So the 15-member grouping became a 13-member organization. These are the current members. This group basically functions like a cartel. A cartel which regulates their business. 
they control the production and by controlling production they control the prices is that clear by controlling production volumes they regulate the global oil prices they essentially fix or determine the oil prices as required by them they will increase or decrease the oil prices by regulating the production levels so they set production targets for the member countries and they have to abide by the production targets so they they are essentially controlling the supply when they control the supply they can easily fix the prices or determine the prices the functioning of opec is often quite controversial and it is heavily criticized by india is that clear for take for example last year when the pandemic broke out and lockdowns were imposed around the world global oil prices crashed immediately because of the sudden crash in demand so what did the opec grouping do they got together they deliberately halted their production they brought down their production also drastically in order to artificially rise the prices now this has a huge impact on countries like india even on countries like china which are largely oil importing nations it shoots up our import bill and adds to our current account deficit so india has always protested against this we have criticized the way in which opec fixes the oil prices they regulate the supply tightly control the production targets and thereby fix or determine the oil prices so there's a related grouping known as opec plus is that clear opec plus is a informal setup which includes the opec countries the 13 opec countries are part of it plus there are 10 non opec countries the other major oil producers even they are part of this collective known as the opec plus grouping which are these countries it includes mexico russia sudan and south sudan kazakhstan azerbaijan bahrain then oman malaysia and brunei these 10 countries which you can see in this map even they are oil producing and oil exporting nations but they are not part of the opec they are part of opec plus which is a expanded grouping that includes 13 opec countries and 10 non opec nations okay so now let's go back to the question and identify the correct answer first statement says opec tries to reduce global oil prices this statement would actually be incorrect because see opec is not just reducing prices it is setting the price or determining the price it will fix the price it might either increase the prices or decrease the prices so first statement is incorrect because it says that opec is always reducing the oil prices that's not the primary objective the objective is to fix or determine the prices second statement is actually correct because it sets oil production targets for the member nations which we just discussed discourage oil consumption to tackle climate change this is not an objective of opec that goes against their interests they actually encourage the consumption of fossil fuels right they don't really discourage oil consumption because it simply goes against their interests so third statement is also incorrect it is absurd so you can cast it out the fourth statement says fix global demand for oil this again is incorrect how can producers determine demand demand comes from the consumers like india and china right demand can't be fixed demand can't be fixed by the producers so fourth statement is also incorrect so it's only the second statement which is right so option b two only is the right answer they are setting production targets through which they are determining oil prices is that clear so opec and opec plus are two important groupings for your prelims moving on the next question the gender parity index or gpi is brought out by which international organization world economic forum un women unesco or world bank the correct answer is option c unesco it is unesco which publishes the gender parity index so let's understand what is this index this index is is in news it 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 is often reported with regard to india's education so it's important to understand what exactly is the gender parity index see this index will determine the access to education 
and the parity in education for boys and girls. It looks at gender parity in education. It covers both primary and secondary education. It covers all the levels of education, lower education and tries to determine what kind of access, what kind of parity exists between boys and girls in the schooling system. Is that clear? If the GPI is exactly 1, it means that there is gender parity. If it is exactly 1, it means that there is gender parity. It also means that the number of boys in schools are exactly the same as number of girls in schools. The, the ratio would be a perfect balance, meaning both boys and girls have equal access to education that is both primary and secondary education. If the index falls below 1, then it means that the gender parity favors the boys meaning there are more boys in schools than girls. It means girl education is getting discouraged if the index is below 1. If the index is above 1, then it means that gender parity is in favor of the girls. It means there are more number of girls in our schools than as compared to the number of boys. In the case of India, there has been a significant improvement that we have achieved over the last two to three decades. In the 1990s, our gender parity index was always below 1, meaning it favored the boy students, the, the male students, whereas there were fewer girl students in our schools, in our education system. But thanks to the government's intervention through various government schemes, girl education has been actively promoted and today our gender parity index is consistently above 1. The latest report indicates that gender parity index for India is greater than 1, meaning we have more girls in schools as compared to boys. This is definitely a positive sign as it points towards improvement in women empowerment. It, it points towards gender equality and gender parity with regard to education. Okay, That is why the index is important. It is published by UNESCO. Now please don't confuse this with the global gender gap report. This is an entirely different report. UNESCO publishes the gender parity index. It deals with the number of boys and girls in schools in our education system. Whereas global gender gap report is entirely different. It is brought out by the World Economic Forum. Is that clear? These are two separate indices and two separate reports. The global gender gap report tries to measure gender equality. It tries to measure gender equality across four important parameters. It looks at the extent of women participation in the economy. It looks at the educational status of women, the health status of women as compared to men and the participation of women in politics. These are the four parameters. Please remember them. Please write down the four parameters. These four parameters are used to determine gender equality in a country. And this report is brought out every year by the World Economic Forum. Is that clear? Now, India's performance on this report, on this index is very, very poor. India performs very poorly on all the four parameters. In fact, according to the latest report, the 2021 report, India has slipped 28 positions. India's ranking has dropped by 28 positions and we rank 140th amongst 156 nations. It's a very poor rank that India is holding and ironically in the South Asia region, India is one of the worst performers when it comes to gender equality. That shows the extent of discrimination that exists on the lines of gender, right? So it's an important report brought out by the World Economic Forum. So please know which organization is publishing the report, what are the key parameters on which the index is being designed or measured and what is India's performance, what is India's rank. Right? These facts will be important for your prelims. Next question. Which of the following program or programs was started at the initiative of UNESCO? Since we were talking about UNESCO, let's take up one more question and look at a few initiatives, programs of UNESCO, which can be important for prelims. Is it man and biosphere program or the world heritage program or sustainable development goals? See the man and biosphere program 
or abbreviated as MAB, M -A -B, was started in 1971 by UNESCO. So the first one is correct. This initiative was started to promote the relationship between people and their environment. This initiative was started to promote the interaction between human beings and their immediate environment. This initiative is focused on community oriented conservation and protection efforts. It is under this program that biosphere, biosphere reserves are established around the world. UNESCO runs a network, a global network or a world network of biosphere reserves and these reserves are established under the Man and Biosphere program. In India as well, we have established plenty of biosphere reserves and some of them have been designated as part of the Man and Biosphere program. So these biosphere reserves in India, around 10 of them, they receive funding and assistance from UNESCO in their conservation efforts. UNESCO will provide funding and technical assistance in conservation of these biosphere reserves in India. So there is a global network or a world network of biosphere reserves which are established and maintained under the Man and Biosphere program. Under this program, the focus is on building relations between people and their environment. The indigenous communities, the tribal communities, the forest dwelling groups, they are given top priority in conservation programs. That is the focus of the Man and Biosphere program. Next, the World Heritage Program. This is again an initiative of UNESCO. Under the World Heritage Program, several natural and cultural sites from around the world, they are selected and designated as World Heritage Sites if they have outstanding value to humanity. It could be a natural site like a monument or a, I'm sorry, it could be a natural site like a a forest or a biosphere reserve or an ecosystem or it could be a cultural site like a monument. So natural and cultural sites from around the world which have outstanding value to humanity, such sites are selected under the program and they are designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. In India, we have plenty of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. We have both natural and cultural sites. There is a third category under which the status is given, it's called a mixed category. For example, a site could have both natural importance and cultural importance. For example, the Kanchenjunga Biosphere Reserve in Sikkim, it has natural significance and cultural significance as well, right? So such mixed sites or even natural cultural sites are given the tag of World Heritage Site by the UNESCO, right? This helps in conservation of these sites. It again brings better funding, better assistance to protect these sensitive sites which add tremendous value to humanity. Okay? The third one, Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. This initiative was not started by UNESCO. Okay? It was launched by the UN General Assembly. It was the UNGA which launched the 2030 Agenda which is basically a set of 17 targets to be achieved under the Sustainable Development Agenda, right? Previously, we had something known as MDGs or Millennium Development Goals. These goals were applicable for the period 2000 to 2015. The MDGs have now been replaced by the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals or also known as the 2030 Agenda and a set of 17 broad goals and targets have been identified and there are many sub-targets under each of these goals. The period for implementation of these goals is 2015 to 2030. Okay, this initiative was started by the UN General Assembly, not UNESCO. And to fund the sustainable development programs, there is something known as the Addis Ababa Action Agenda that has been set up under the UN. This is a financing mechanism for the Sustainable Development Program. The Addis Ababa Action Agenda of the UN provides funding and financial and technical support to the smaller countries, to the developing and underdeveloped nations to implement and achieve their sustainable targets, right? So third one is not an initiative of UNESCO, 
So one and two only is the correct answer. Option B is the right answer. Let's move on to the next question. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency or UNRWA has been set up to support the relief and human development of which group of refugees? Is it for Afghan refugees or the Rohingya refugees or the Palestinian refugees or the Syrian and Yemeni refugees? What's the correct answer? See, the UNRWA was established in the year 1949 following the Palestinian war. After Israel declared unilateral independence in 1948, all the Arab countries, they got together and they declared war against Israel. The Arab countries came to support the Palestinian cause, to support the Palestinian people, to have their own independent nation. In this war, there were thousands of Palestinian refugees who were created in the Israel-Palestine region. So to protect them, to give them basic rehabilitation and to rebuild their lives, the UN established a relief agency known as the UNRWA. Its only mandate is to help the Palestinian refugees. Its mandate is to protect and rehabilitate the Palestinian refugees. This agency runs refugee camps in Palestinian areas such as the Gaza Strip, which you can see over here in this map, and as well as in the West Bank region. It runs refugee camps in Gaza Strip and West Bank and also in the neighboring countries where Palestinian refugees are received. For example, in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon. In these countries, in the neighboring countries, UNRWA has set up a few refugee camps to accommodate the incoming Palestinian refugees. Because see, even after the first war of 1948-49, there have been several conflicts and clashes which keep occurring in the Israel-Palestine region. There was the 1967 war. There have been intifadas launched by the militant outfits. Recently, just a few months back, there were fresh clashes between Israel and Hamas, which is an extremist group fighting for the Palestinians. So this region has seen long periods of violence. There have been many wars and conflicts. So constantly refugees are being created in the region. So UNRWA continues to function over here. It has set up its camps in Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, and in the neighboring countries like Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan to protect the Palestinian refugees. Okay, the topic is important because recently it was in news when Israel clashed with Hamas just a few months ago. Israel again conducted airstrikes in the Gaza Strip and several more refugees were created. Right, So that's why the organization can be important for your prelims. Moving on to the next question. The HLPF or the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development is held under the auspicious of which of the following bodies? Is it under UNDP or ECOSOC or UNEP or the Climate Change Convention? The correct answer is option B. The High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development functions under the United Nations Economic and Social Council or also known as ECOSOC. Is that clear? The HLPF is responsible for reviewing the progress towards achieving sustainable development goals of the UN. The UN is striving towards achieving the sustainable development goals around the world and a high level political forum has been set up as a subsidiary body. It functions as a subsidiary body of the UN, of the United Nations. And it reviews the implementation and the progress towards achieving the sustainable development targets. This forum, this subsidiary body of the UN, functions under the ECOSOC or the UN Economic and Social Council. Okay, So another important international platform which is needed for your prelims. Now let's take up a related question on the ECOSOC itself. Because the ECOSOC is also a very, very important organ of the United Nations. Consider the following statements with respect to the United Nations Economic and Social Council. It is one of the six principal organs of the UN. It consists of 54 member states which are elected yearly by the UN General Assembly 
for overlapping three year terms on the basis of an equitable geographical quota. It reviews the implementation of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Which of the statements are correct? See the United Nations when it was established in 1945 after the Second World War, its constitution, its composition and its functions were provided by the UN Charter. Under the UN Charter, six principal organs of the UN have been identified. These are the principal organs of the UN. The UN General Assembly or the UNGA, the UN Security Council which we studied in the last class, the ICJ or the International Court of Justice which is the judicial arm of the UN, the UN Secretariat which functions as the executive arm of the United Nations. Then we have the trusteeship council which was set up to administer the trusteeship territories which were part of former colonies. After the world war ended some of the former colonies of, of European powers right they were moving towards independence and and self rule. So to provide for the transition a trusteeship council was set up and many of these trusteeship territories they were directly administered by the UN for a period of time. So this administration of the colonies was taken care of by the trusteeship council until they transitioned into independent nations. Today all these trusteeship territories have become independent, they are independent countries today. So the functions of the trusteeship council came to an end and this council has been wound up, it, its functioning has come to an end. The other principal organ is the ECOSOC or the UN Economic and Social Council. This council functions like a think tank. You can say that it's a think tank of the UN. It primarily focuses on the socio-economic agenda of the United Nations. Be it education related initiatives, be it poverty, be it climate change, be it healthcare related initiatives. All these programs and initiatives of the UN, they are crafted, they are designed and implemented by the ECOSOC or the UN Economic and Social Council. So the first statement is definitely correct. It's one of the six principal organs. The composition of this institution is also very important because India has been a member of this, right? We have been a member in the past as well. It consists of 54 countries which are elected yearly by the UN General Assembly. Once elected, they will have a three year term. It's an overlapping term because the seats will be vacated on a rotational basis and there are seats reserved on the basis of geographical representation. So second statement is absolutely correct. The third statement is also correct because we just discussed what does the ECOSOC do. In the last question, we spoke about the high level political forum which is part of the ECOSOC. So ECOSOC is responsible for reviewing the implementation and the progress towards achieving the 2030 agenda, right? So all three statements are correct. Option D is your right answer. So such global institutions can be very important for your prelims. Honestly, it's very hard to predict which grouping, which institution can be important. But based on current affairs, based on recent developments, we can shortlist some topics like this and you have to prepare for that because UPSC will pick out such questions. Every year there will be a few questions on international institutions and regional and global organizations, right? All the questions are usually picked from current affairs. It's not a random pick. So the more you cover current affairs, the more you look at these facts and the background, easier would it would be for you to answer the questions in prelims. Moving on to the next question, consider the following statements. Chemical Weapons Convention became the world's first multilateral disarmament agreement to provide for the elimination of an entire category of WMDs or weapons of mass destruction. The OPCW or the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons is the implementing body for this convention. India hasn't signed the Chemical Weapons Convention as it retains a chemical weapons stockpile. Which of the statements are correct? Let's talk about the background, let's talk about the convention and OPCW, then it will be easy to answer this question. The Chemical Weapons Convention was signed in 1993 and it came into force in 1997. 
this made the chemical weapons convention the first ever multilateral disarmament agreement that provided for the complete elimination of an entire category of wmds this convention provides for the prohibition of development production usage and supply of chemical weapons around the world countries once they sign and ratify they cannot develop chemical weapons not even the raw materials they can't produce them they can't use them and export them to other countries they can't use them in actual wars and conflicts it has been completely prohibited and provides for the elimination of the existing stockpile that is why this convention is so important okay the first statement is correct so to enforce the convention to enforce the provisions a new organization was set up known as opcw it is the mandate of opcw to enforce the provisions of this convention so it has the powers to carry out inspections to check whether countries are destroying their chemical weapon stockpile it has the powers to investigate whether chemical weapons have been used in a conflict or against people right see the convention and the group is in news because in the last few years there have been several reports of chemical weapons being used in syria that is why the topic is in news it keeps coming up every now and then it has been alleged that the syrian government headed by bashar al assad has used chemical weapons during the civil war against civilians so this is a prohibited act under the convention and hence opcw was in news along with the chemical weapons convention this organization has achieved a high degree of success in fact it was even awarded the nobel peace prize in 2013 for its direct role in destroying 98% of the world's stockpile of chemical weapons that's a tremendous achievement 98% of the global stockpile of chemical weapons have been destroyed forever because of the efforts of opcw is that clear then india india has not only signed the convention we have even ratified the convention okay following this india even enacted the chemical weapons convention act in 2000 and we even est established the national authority for the chemical weapons convention this national authority has been set up under the cabinet secretariat it functions under the cabinet secretariat the task of the national authority for chemical weapons convention is to coordinate with opcw and allow for inspections it is the nodal institution to work with opcw it has been given the mandate to destroy all the chemical weapon stockpile of india and india has successfully eliminated all the stockpiles that it had india did have a few chemical weapons in its stockpile but today we have destroyed all the stockpiles and the national authority for cwc has ensured this it was placed directly under the cabinet secretariat so that the prime minister can have direct oversight over the functioning of this institution it has worked with opcw and india's chemical weapon stockpile has been destroyed as per the convention okay also note down the countries which are outside of the convention there is israel which has signed the convention but not ratified it then there are non signatories they have neither signed it nor ratified it that includes egypt north korea and south sudan so such important points will be very very relevant for your prelims okay the topic has been in news in the last one year so please watch out for the convention and the opcw both can be important moving on to the next question which of the following falls under the mandate of the iaea or the international atomic energy agency promoting peaceful use of nuclear energy and inhibiting its use for any military purpose promoting nuclear safety and nuclear security standards establish a civilian nuclear program in every member state see the international atomic energy agency was established in the year 1957 initially it was known as atoms for peace the iaea is not a un body 
it's not part of the UN. That's what I mean to say. It's not part of the United Nations. It has been set up as an independent agency. It's independent of the UN. But however, it reports to the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. Its mandate is to promote the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. This is one of the mandates. Its mandate is to promote the civilian applications of nuclear energy, which includes production of electricity. It, it also includes the medical applications. For example, the usage of nuclear material in cancer treatment. It's used in chemotherapy, right? So such peaceful civilian usage of nuclear energy is promoted by the IAEA. That's one of its mandate. It is also mandated to inhibit and prevent the military purpose of nuclear energy, which is the development of nuclear weapons. IAEA is supposed to act against the development of nuclear weapons. And the third role of IAEA is to promote nuclear safety and nuclear security standards. It has the mandate to prevent proliferation, that is the leakage of nuclear materials and nuclear technology. It has the mandate to lay down standards for nuclear facilities around the world. So nuclear reactors around the world and even the movement of nuclear materials, right? They have to follow the strict standards laid down by the IAEA. These are the three main roles of the IAEA. Promoting the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, preventing the development of nuclear weapons and promoting nuclear safety and security standards. It does not have the role to establish a nuclear program in every member state. That is not its purpose. Okay? It does help the countries whenever a country is looking towards civilian nuclear energy. IAEA will provide the assistance. But it will not go out to every country and try to establish a nuclear program. So that makes the third statement incorrect. So one and two only. Option B is the right answer. See, this institution also has the powers to carry out inspections to check whether there is nuclear proliferation taking place. It can inspect nuclear facilities to check whether countries are following the safety security standards. Okay? IAEA is frequently in news, mainly because of Iran's nuclear weapons program. IAEA inspectors, they arrive in Iran, they go to Iran to inspect its nuclear facilities as per the nuclear deal. Even India for that matter, we have separated our military reactors from civilian reactors. After we signed the nuclear deal with US, the India-US nuclear deal, we separated our military and civilian reactors and we have allowed IAEA inspections for the civilian facilities of India, the civilian nuclear facilities of India. Is that clear? That is why IAEA is so important. It's frequently in news, mainly because of Iran's nuclear weapons program. Okay? So it's an important institution, so please make a note of it. Next question. India, Russia and China are members of which of the following groups? BRICS, SCO, RIC, East Asia Summit. This should be a very simple, straightforward question to answer because we have covered almost all these groupings in detail. Yesterday we spoke about BRICS. Today we discussed SCO. RIC is a trilateral. It's a trilateral initiative for India, Russia, China to interact with each other. They meet regularly. Just a few months back, a RIC trilateral took place. And these three countries, they work together on major issues of the world. They look at global economic issues, strategic issues, terrorism, etc. So RIC trilateral involves India, Russia and China. Then if you remember the first class, we spoke about East Asia Summit. This summit includes the 10 ASEAN countries, the 10 Southeast Asian countries, plus the dialogue partners of ASEAN, which includes India, China, Japan, South Korea, then you have Russia, Australia, New Zealand, right? US. All these countries are part of the East Asia Summit. So obviously India, Russia, China are part of this. So in all the four groups mentioned over here, these three countries can be found. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Option D is the correct answer. Moving on to the next question. The Geneva Conventions of 1949 
and their additional protocols deal with diplomatic relations, conduct of armed conflict and standards for humanitarian treatment in war, nuclear disarmament and rules of engagement in case of a nuclear conflict, role of United Nations and its bodies. What's the correct answer? See, the Geneva Conventions, it's a plural word. It is a collection of various treaties and additional protocols. It includes four different treaties and three additional protocols. They were adopted from 1949 onwards following the Second World War. These treaties and additional protocols, they deal with humanitarian treatment during war. They lay down the standards for armed conflict. They basically provide a set of basic rights to the military personnel who are fighting the war, that is for the soldiers. It provides a set of rights for civilians who might get caught in conflicts. It also accords a set of rights for POWs or prisoners of war. So in case of wars and conflicts, be it a soldier, be it a civilian or be it a POW has been captured, they have to be treated on humanitarian grounds. The other country which has captured them, they cannot commit torture, right? They can't subject them to brutality. They can't commit violence against them. So this convention is crucial for promoting humanitarian treatment during wars and it lays down the conduct for armed conflict, okay? Even this topic is frequently in news because of frequent clashes and wars that take place around the world. In 2019, after India carried out the Balkot airstrikes, an Indian Air Force pilot was captured by Pakistan, right? Wing Commander Abhinandan was captured. So when he was captured before he was returned to India, India brought up the Geneva Convention and reminded Pakistan to treat Wing Commander Abhinandan with utmost respect on humanitarian grounds because all the countries have an obligation under the Geneva Convention. India reminded Pakistan of these obligations during this incident. So because of all these developments, the Geneva Conventions can be important. So just know what it deals with, what is its primary purpose. So option B would become the correct answer. Moving on, the next question. Operation Devi Shakti, recently seen in news, refers to India's assistance to Indian Ocean and African countries during the pandemic, India's naval exercise with France and Russia in the Indian Ocean, India's evacuation of its nationals and Afghan partners from Afghanistan for following the Taliban takeover, India's cross-border strikes in Myanmar targeting insurgent camps. What's the correct answer? See, Operation Devi Shakti was recently in news, just last month. After the Taliban took over Afghanistan, right? A threat, a major threat was perceived for Indian nationals and as well as for the friends of India in Afghanistan. The people of Afghanistan have been, of, have been great friends of India. They have been partners for India, right? In the previous classes, we have discussed the kind of projects we have executed. We have invested $3 billion in the country and India has generated a lot of goodwill. India enjoys a lot of soft power in Afghanistan even today, despite the current situation. So Indian nationals, including Indian diplomats, Indian officials, along with our Afghan partners and friends, they were facing a crisis, they were facing a threat to their lives when the Taliban took over. So most countries, other countries, they started evacuating their nationals. Similarly, India also carried out a massive evacuation. We used the C-17 Globemaster, the massive military transport aircraft, which we have procured from the US. It is a strategic lift uh, aircraft. It can be used to lift hundreds of people at the same time. This aircraft can even carry heavy military equipment, including helicopters, battle tanks, etc. Right? So the C-17 Globemaster has been used many times for such operations. It's also used in disaster management. Right? So to carry out this evacuation, India launched Operation Devi Shakti. And the Indian Air Force used the C-17 Globemasters along with regular Air India commercial flights to bring back hundreds of Indian nationals and the friends of India, the partners of India from Afghanistan back to the country, right? They were brought back to safety. Several Afghan officials, Afghan ministers and, and Afghan nationals who have helped India, they were all brought back and many Indian nationals along with the Indian diplomats and Indian officials, they were all rescued and evacuated 
under Operation Devi Shakti. So that's another important topic. Next question. Consider the following statements with regard to India's Pan-African e-network project. It was conceived by former president Dr. Abdul Kalam and was formally launched in 2009. India has set up a fiber optic network under the project to provide satellite connectivity, telemedicine and teleeducation to African countries. So we have to check whether these statements are correct. See the Pan-African e-network connectivity project. It's a ICT initiative between India and Africa. It's a initiative based on information and communication technology. Through this initiative, India has provided satellite services and tele-education and tele-medicine to poor African nations. It's again a goodwill initiative. It's a soft power initiative designed to promote India's image in African countries. This initiative was proposed by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam when he was the president of India. As the president, he, he was on a diplomatic visit to African nations and he came out with the idea. He suggested that India can make use of its ICT leverage, right? Because India is a leading power in the field of ICT and satellite communication, right? ISRO has plenty of satellites that provide for such civilian services. Then Indian companies, Indian institutions, they specialize in ICT services like tele-education, tele-medicine. So this initiative was proposed and later the MEA turned this into a very, very important program. The Pan-African e-network project was launched in 2009 and a government-owned firm known as TCIL has executed this project. The Telecommunication Consultants India Limited, it's a government entity. It has executed the project through which we have built OFC networks connecting these countries. A submarine cable has also been laid connecting India with Africa. And a regional satellite of African nations along with ISRO satellite services are being used to provide telemedicine and teleeducation to African countries. Under this initiative, elite Indian institutions Indian colleges, Indian universities, Indian hospitals and research centers, they have been connected with Africa. So students from Africa, patients from Africa, they can access high quality education and healthcare from Indian institutions. That is the purpose of the initiative. Okay. So both the statements are correct. Option C is the correct answer. This topic has been in news because India is further expanding the initiative. The phase one of the project was completed. Now under phase two, we are reaching out to more countries and we are trying to expand the connectivity project even further. Okay, that's why the topic is important. Next, recently, India has revived an initiative for a preferential trade agreement with which of the following groupings? Is it the Southern African Customs Union or SACU or the Indian Ocean Commission, which we studied in the first class or ASEAN or IORA? The correct answer is option A. See, in previous classes, we have covered the Indian Ocean Commission, ASEAN and IORA. Now, let's talk about SACU. That's why this question was picked. Because recently, just a few months back, I think in March 2021, it was reported that India is reviving its preferential trade agreement talks with a grouping known as SACU. SACU stands for the Southern African Customs Union. It's a customs union, it, it's a preferential trade arrangement that these countries have which are located in the southern part of Africa. The members of this group include South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Swaziland and Lesotho. Okay, These are the five southern African nations which have come together to form this customs union. Now India has good trading relations with all of them especially Namibia and South Africa. They have plenty of precious resources that India requires. We have a strong trading relationship with Namibia and South Africa. So to further take this forward and to reduce the barriers to trade and to bring down the tariffs, we are talking to these countries 
about working out a PTA, a preferential trade agreement. These talks were started back in 2007. But after several rounds of negotiations, they had come to a halt because we had hit a dead end. Both the sides were not conceding their positions and the talks had come to a halt. The negotiations had stopped. But this year, again, India has revived these negotiations. That is why the grouping was in news. So UPSC could ask a basic question on the SACU, the Southern African Customs Union. So please be aware of the member countries and which region is this grouping focused upon, right? Such basic knowledge would be sufficient to answer prelims questions. Now let's go to the next question. Recently, the Prime Minister of India met with 14 leaders of this group of countries on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in New York. During the meet, India announced a grant of $14 million for community development works in the region represented by this grouping. And another $150 million line of credit was announced by India for solar, renewable energy, climate change related projects. This region has the presence of more than a million strong Indian diaspora. Which grouping does this description refer to? Even such questions appear in UPSC exams, where UPSC will give a detailed description of something and they will expect the students to identify what does the description deal with. Here it refers to a particular grouping, a regional organization and the description has been given. The correct answer is option D. It's the CARICOM or the Caribbean community. Okay, It's not the African Union, not GCC, not PIF. It's the CARICOM, the Caribbean community. In 2019, when Prime Minister Modi was participating at the UN General Assembly Summit, he met with the leaders of CARICOM. This grouping represents the Caribbean region. It includes 15 members, okay, 14 countries and one dependent state. There are 14 nations over here in the Caribbean region, in the West Indies region, and one of them is a dependent state. India has very close cultural relations with this region because this region is home to a very strong Indian community. There's a very strong Indian diaspora over here. That's because during the colonial days, the British had transported several Indian families to these colonies as a part of the indentured labor system. As a part of the indentured labor system, Indians were transported by the British and left here in these islands to work for their enterprises, to take care of their farms, their factories, etc. So many Indian families have settled over there generations after generations and this offers us a strong cultural connect. Okay, It includes countries like Belize, it's a Central American country, it has Jamaica, Haiti, Guyana, Suriname, right? Then several other nations, small islands over here in the West Indies, Caribbean region. These countries, they traditionally have good relations with India. We do provide economic support to them. And when the Prime Minister announced this funding, right, we gave $14 million for community development projects. And a line of credit was announced for clean renewable energy projects. Following this, the Prime Minister invited the CARICOM countries to join the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. These are two major initiatives that have been started by India. India launched the International Solar Alliance to exploit the power of the sun to generate renewable energy. And we launched the initiative at the Paris summit of the Climate Change Convention in 2015. Right? It's one of the most popular initiatives launched by India. We are tapping the solar potential in tropical countries especially and more than 120 countries have joined this initiative, which was started by India. So the Prime Minister invited these countries also to be a part of the group. Then with regard to disaster management, we have launched the CDRI, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. These initiatives are very crucial, keeping in mind the impact of climate change and the rising impact of natural disasters and extreme weather events. Right? Extreme weather events have gone up around the world, increasing the frequency and, and uh, the impact of disasters. So India has launched this initiative known as the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. 
so this initiative is mainly focused on the vulnerable countries and we have invited the caricom nations to join these indian initiatives okay that is why the grouping was in news and please note down the kind of funding the kind of support we have given the cultural connection that we have and please note the support that india receives from the caricom countries at the united nations at the un these countries of the caricom region they give india tremendous support especially with regard to un reforms next question the talin manual on cyber conflicts and cyber warfare was brought out by which organization unsc european union nato or the fatf see talin the name talin refers to the capital of estonia estonia is a east european country it was part of the former soviet republic so at this place known as talin the nato it has a center for cyber security for cyber security and cyber defense the nato has set up a center of excellence at talin nato is a military grouping a military grouping led by us and west european countries right the north atlantic treaty organization so nato has established a cyber security center a cyber defense center for excellence at talin so this institution of nato came out with this Tal talin manual that deals with cyber conflicts and cyber warfare it specifically deals with the international law that is applicable to cyber warfare is that clear it it is basically an academic study through an academic study a report has been brought out this contains the standards the legal standards the legal framework that should be applied at the international level while dealing with cyber wars and cyber conflicts understood so this manual is in news because recently the third edition has been launched the first edi edition was launched in 2013 by nato and cambridge university they are working together on this initiative cambridge Uni university press and nato brought out the talent manual in 2013 then in 2017 they upgraded the talent manual and they brought out the second edition the 2.0 edition now recently this year in 2021 they have started the work on the third edition that is talent manual 3.0 it contains a legal framework that is the international law which should be applicable to cyber warfare and cyber conflicts see there are only two such legal frameworks that deal with cyber related issues one is the talent manual which specifically deals with cyber wars and cyber conflicts then we have the budapest convention which deals with cyber crimes is that clear budapest convention is an initiative of the council of europe do not confuse this with the european union eu is different council of europe is a different european organization it has brought out the budapest convention that deals with cyber crimes only that is with cyber theft child pornography then trafficking and smuggling through online mediums right then ransomware attacks such cyber crimes are dealt with by the budapest convention so this is one of the international legal frameworks we have to deal with cyber threats but to deal with cyber warfare cyber espionage and cyber conflicts the talent manual has been brought out by the nato okay it provides a set of standards recommendations which could be used in international law while dealing with cyber wars so india was considering a proposal to join the budapest convention india wanted to join the budapest convention but we have decided not to join for now because we are concerned about cyber safety and data security if we join these countries under the budapest convention okay so please be aware of both the legal frameworks the international legal frameworks that are there budapest convention deals with cyber crimes talin manual deals with cyber wars and conflicts next question the oic the organization of islamic cooperation is headquartered at istanbul jeda tehran islamabad the correct answer is option b jeda in saudi arabia that is where the oic is headquartered 
it's one of the most important international organizations it's frequently in news and from india's perspective oic is important this grouping was established back in 1969 today it consists of 57 member countries this grouping basically represents the interests of the muslim world the primary objective of oic is to represent and act as the voice of the muslim world it also tries to promote peace and stability in the world that is its objective in this grouping 53 member member countries are muslim majority countries 53 member countries are muslim majority countries and a few countries have a significant muslim population here in this map you can see the various countries which are members of the group we have many muslim nations from southeast asia like malaysia indonesia and the others we have countries from south asia like bangladesh pakistan and maldives many countries from africa west asia central asia even from south america but interestingly india is not a member india is said to have one of the highest muslim population in the world along with indonesia but india has been left out india has made many attempts to join the grouping as a member but pakistan has used the platform to block india's entry many countries many members of oic are close friends of india saudi arabia for example right indonesia uae right all these countries many countries in this region they are very close friends of india and they were ready to admit india but every time pakistan uses its influence and blocks india's entry into the grouping the reason is pakistan has used the oic platform to internationalize the kashmir dispute pakistan has used oic to target india repeatedly over the issue of jammu and kashmir it keeps bringing up allegations of human right violations by india in kashmir it even brought up the controversial citizenship amendment act and it tried to internationalize these internal issues of india so for pakistan this is a platform where it can target india by bringing up these issues issues related to kashmir citizenship amendment act and the others right so that is why the grouping is so important every now and then pakistan led resolutions are brought up against india they are even adopted and oic criticizes india so this brings international pressure on india and india fights back and india also puts up a counter position to these arguments that is why india wants to become a member of the oic because india has a legitimate right right we have a significant muslim population and since the grouping represents the the voice of the muslim world india has every right to be a part of the group but pakistan manages to use the influence of other powers major powers like turkey sometimes iran and malaysia to target india it makes the makes use of the support of these countries to target india previously even saudi arabia uae they were supporting pakistan they would always back pakistan as well a few years back but in the last one decade the relations have completely changed between india and the west asian countries today saudi arabia and uae they have changed their position they largely extend support to india and in many cases they have even ignored pakistan but pakistan has found new allies in the form of turkey and malaysia and uses their support to target india at the oic so that is why the grouping is important the membership its background and why it is of concern to india okay so that's about the organization of islamic cooperation moving on to the next question the european bank for reconstruction and development or ebrd was established to help build a new post cold war era in central and eastern europe it has members from all around the world recently india has become its 69th shareholder which of the statements are correct see ebrd was established in 1991 after the end of the cold war and after the soviet union collapsed after the soviet union disintegrated many new countries were born in central and eastern europe so to provide for their reconstruction and their development this financial institution was set up 
known as EBRD. So the first statement is correct. It was set up in the post Cold War era to help development and to finance initiatives in the central and eastern parts of Europe. This financial institution has members from around the world. There are 69 members who hold shares at this financial institution. Okay, It is headquartered in the United Kingdom but it has members from around the world. It has US. US is the largest shareholder at this bank. Then there is Australia, there is Japan. So many countries from around the world are also members of this financial institution. Of course you have all major European countries which also hold shares at this financial institution. Now this bank is important. It was in news because recently India has become the 69th shareholder of this bank. Is that clear? India is very much focused on Central and Eastern Europe. We are looking to take up few connectivity projects in this region. That is why India took part in this initiative. And recently we have become the 69th member of this bank. So all the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. Next question. The GCC or the Gulf Cooperation Council recently ended its rift with which member? Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait. To answer this question, you should know what is the GCC. What was the rift or the internal divide that GCC was dealing with? See, the Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC is a very important regional grouping that represents the Gulf region or the Arabian Peninsula. This grouping was set up back in 1981. It brings together the major Sunni powers of the Gulf region. This grouping is largely led by Saudi Arabia and the other major powers include United Arab Emirates and Qatar. Okay? In total, there are six countries that are members of the council. We have Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman and of course the other three countries that we mentioned. So these six countries have formed the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. It's a political grouping. It's also an economic grouping because they co cooperate with each other economically and they deal with all the mutual issues of concern through this regional organization. Just like we have SARC for South Asia, there is the GCC for the Gulf region. See, this grouping essentially represents the Sunni power bloc. Remember, we had discussed in the first class that in West Asia, there is a a major sectarian divide between the, the Sunni countries and the Shia powers. Saudi Arabia and UAE lead the, the Sunni power bloc, whereas Iran, Syria and the others, they lead the Shia power bloc. Recently in 2017, Qatar was thrown out of the group. It was boycotted by the GCC members. What happened was, it was alleged by Saudi Arabia and UAE that Qatar was working against the interests of the Sunni world. The allegations were that Qatar was sponsoring an extremist group known as Muslim Brotherhood, which is mainly based out of Egypt. Saudi Arabia has banned the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay? According to these allegations, Qatar was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, which according to Saudi Arabia, works against the interests of the Sunni world. The other allegation was that Qatar was aligning with Iran, which is their major rival. Iran is the leader of the Shia world, the Shia power bloc. Saudi Arabia alleged that Qatar was sponsoring radical groups and extremist groups like the Hamas, which operates in the Gaza Strip of Palestine and the Hezbollah, which operates in Lebanon. These are extremist militant groups sponsored by Iran as a part of its covert war against Israel and Saudi interests. Is that clear? Iran, which is a Shia power, sponsors a few extremist outfits in the region like Hamas and Hezbollah to target Israel, to target Israel and American and Saudi interests. So Saudi Arabia and UAE which lead the Sunni world, they alleged that Qatar was backstabbing them. It alleged that Qatar was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood and working with Iran and sponsoring 
groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. Saudi Arabia also took offense to the media coverage by Al Jazeera, a very popular media network. It is funded by the Qatar government. The government of Qatar funds Al Jazeera. So all these issues came up and Saudi Arabia kicked out Qatar from the grouping. Since it's the leader of GCC, it brought all the members together and Qatar was boycotted and thrown out. They even placed a blockade on Qatar. They placed a diplomatic blockade. They cut off all diplomatic relations. They placed an economic blockade. They stopped all trade with Qatar and they even closed all forms of connectivity. Flights were suspended, roads and any other form of connectivity. Everything was shut and Qatar was isolated in the Gulf region. So that is why this topic is important. That is why the topic was in news. Is that clear? Recently, in 2021, at the start of this year, Qatar was admitted back into the group. After three years of conflict and internal rifts within the grouping, finally, they managed to mend their relations and Qatar was brought back into the GCC by signing an agreement. Uh, agreement was signed under the GCC, and Qatar was brought back and the blockade, the restrictions, everything has been lifted. So these countries have re-established diplomatic relations. They have lifted the blockade, the economic and connectivity blockade that they had placed on Qatar. Okay, so that is why the grouping was in news and that's why it's ca it can be important for your prelims exam. Because the decision to bring Qatar back was taken very recently at the beginning of this year. Now moving on to the next question, it's related to the same region. In 2021, the Indian Air Force participated in exercise Desert Flag for the first time. It is an annual multinational warfare exercise hosted by which country? See, just a few minutes back I mentioned that India's ties with Saudi Arabia and UAE has improved significantly in the last few years. Before 2010, these two Sunni powers, they were largely pro-Pakistan. But off late, India has become very close to these countries. We have elevated our relations to the strategic partnership level. Saudi Arabia and UAE, they not only guarantee energy security to India, they are not only the major oil suppliers to India, but they have also become a major source of investment for India. This is a win-win relationship. So that is why India has become prominent for them in the last few years. So now, whenever India takes a stand against Pakistan, especially Pakistan-sponsored terrorism, Saudi Arabia and UAE are supporting India. For example, after the surgical strikes of 2016, after the Balkot airstrikes of 2019, Saudi Arabia and UAE did not criticize India. Instead, they supported India's right to defend itself against terrorism. So that shows that these countries have become very close strategic partners of India. So today we are working closely with them in the field of counter-terrorism. We share intelligence, exchange intelligence as well. And we even take up joint military exercises and defense exercises. One such exercise to which India was invited was exercise Desert Flag, which is hosted by the United Arab Emirates. It's an annual multinational warfare exercise. It includes US, France, then Saudi Arabia and other countries and India was also invited and the Indian Air Force recently took part in this military exercise. This signifies India's growing strategic military relations with the two major powers of the Gulf region that is Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Moving on to the next question. This again is a description. A description has been given, you, have to, you need to identify what does it refer to? It is an artificial sea level waterway in Egypt connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. It is a part of the Silk Road that connects Europe with Asia. So this description refers to which of the given options? The Gulf of Aqaba, Suez Canal, Kra Isthmus, Panama Canal. All the four locations mentioned over here, they are very, very important from a geography and IR point of view, right? These locations are frequently in news, okay? So let me give you the correct answer for this question. The correct answer is option B. The description here defines or describes the Suez Canal. 
the Suez Canal was in news because a few months back there was an accident. There was an incident which took place in the Suez Canal. A commercial ship, a large commercial container ship got stuck in the Suez Canal and disrupted global shipping for days together. You might have heard about this in newspapers and, and in the media. It was a very big incident. It had a huge global economic impact. Several ships were stuck in the Mediterranean Sea and in the Red Sea and global shipping was affected. Global industrial production was dis disrupted because of this incident in the Suez Canal. So let's look at all these geographical features and understand why they are important. Okay? First, let's look at the Suez Canal. According to the description, it's an artificial man-made canal. It's a, it's a sea level waterway. It connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea. That is the first point you should note. Next, it's present in Egypt. This is the Sinai Desert here, the Sinai Peninsula. And right over here is this narrow canal that connects Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea. This is the most important trading route between Europe and Asia. Right? Because without this canal, ships will have to circumnavigate across Africa. They have to go around Africa. They have to reach the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, take a U-turn and then move towards the Indian Ocean. So this route between Atlantic and Indian Ocean, the traditional route, is a very long circuitous route. It will take more time, it will result in more expenses and it will have a huge economic impact. So the construction of the Suez Canal was one of the landmark developments in modern history. Right? The Suez Canal was built to create a shortcut, a bypass between Europe and Asia. It directly connects the Mediterranean Sea with Asia. That is, it creates an opening towards the Red Sea, which connects with the Indian Ocean. So it is critical for the global economy and even India depends heavily on the Suez Canal. So such narrow waterways are referred to as strategic choke points. Is that clear? It's an important sea lane of communication. It's a critical sea lane of communication or SLOC. And because of its narrow nature, because of its narrow width, and because of its vulnerability, it becomes a strategic choke point. If for some reason, if the canal is blocked, either because of an accident or a terror attack or because of a war or conflict or because of a natural disaster, then it can bring global shipping to a standstill. It can have a huge global economic impact. That is why the Suez Canal is so important. Okay? Next, let me show you where the Gulf of Aqaba is located. Even this is an important location. It's frequently in news. The Gulf of Aqaba is this small water body over here which connects to the Red Sea. Okay? It is shared between Egypt, this is the Sinai Desert of Egypt, and Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. The Gulf of Aqaba is also frequently in news. Next, the Kra Isthmus. The Kra Isthmus is in Thailand. In geography, you would have studied what is an Isthmus. An Isthmus is a narrow patch of land, a very narrow patch of land that connects two larger land areas and separates two large water bodies. That is an isthmus. I'll repeat, an isthmus is a, a narrow patch of land, a narrow strip of land that connects two larger land areas and separates two large water bodies. There is one such isthmus in Thailand. Thailand becomes very narrow at this point. It's hardly a few kilometers in width over here. And this region is known as the Kra Isthmus. This is frequently in news because China is looking to build the Kra Canal across the Isthmus by cutting across the land over here. China is seeking to create a shorter route between the Gulf of Thailand and the Andaman Sea. This is a strategic project for China under its Belt and Road Initiative. Why? Because it will help China overcome its weakness around the Strait of Malacca. The Strait of Malacca sandwiched between Indonesia and Singapore is a weak point. It's a choke point for China. China has always feared that either India or US might block the Strait of Malacca in case of a conflict with China. Because the Indian Navy has a strong presence in the Andaman Sea. 
the US Navy has a strong presence in the Indian Ocean. In case of hostilities with China or tensions with China, either India or US might block the Strait of Malacca, thereby disrupting oil supplies and China's exports and imports. So China is always concerned about its weakness at the Strait of Malacca. So to overcome the weakness, it has planned a bypass. It has planned a, a shorter alternative route, which will connect Gulf of Thailand directly with Andaman Sea, located at the Kra Isthmus. It plans to cut across the land, create this canal, the Kra Canal, to reach out to the Indian Ocean directly without having to pass through the Strait of Malacca. Okay, this is a proposed project. India has some concerns about this project of China because it has strategic implications. The Kra Isthmus is very close to India, very close to the Andaman Nicobar Islands. So that's why the topic is important. Next, the Panama Canal. Even the Panama Canal is an artificial canal located in a country known as Panama. Panama is a Central American country. You can see that over here. Okay. This artificial canal is equally important and it's comparable to the Suez Canal because it has created a shorter route between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Otherwise, to move from here to here, one would have to navigate around the Cape Horn region. That is around Chile. Okay, this is Chile over here. Here we have the Cape Horn region and ships will have to navigate this longer route which would take around 12,000 to 14,000 nautical miles. Panama Canal creates a shorter route, saves a lot of time and a lot of money and hence it's critical for the global economy and critical for the United States. Is that clear? So that is the Panama Canal which is also frequently in news. So these important sea lanes of communication and strategic choke points are very important. They're often in news. So you should know about all the four. Okay. For this question, Suez Canal is the right answer. Now, let's go to the next question. The withdrawal of which country reduced the significance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP? Let's see what is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This was a proposed free trade agreement which was initiated in 2016. This was led by the United States. This free trade agreement was supposed to include the littoral states of the Pacific Ocean. Countries such as US, Mexico, Canada, Peru, Chile and Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand and the others, they were supposed to be a part of this free trade agreement. This proposed free trade agreement was led by the US and it was seen as a rival to the RCEP which was led by China. In the last class we spoke about RCEP and how China is leading the RCEP as the world's largest free trade agreement. As a rival to this, the US was leading the Trans-Pacific Partnership to bring together these Pacific economies, the littoral states of the Pacific Ocean. But this agreement fell apart in 2017 after the US withdrew from the negotiations because the then president, Donald Trump, did not believe in such multilateral trade ag agreements. He believed that these multilateral trade deals, they go against American interests. So Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew the US from the TPP and with the withdrawal of the US, the grouping lost its significance. It lost its relevance. Is that clear? You can also observe that there are few common countries between TPP and RCEP. In RCEP as well, we had Singapore, Japan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand and Brunei. So these countries of the Indo-Pacific, they were part of both RCEP and TPP. But now TPP has lost its relevance because US withdrew from it. US was the key country which was holding it together. After it withdrew, the TPP lost the significance and RCEP finally was put into action and it's a China-led free trade agreement. Okay, so that's about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Moving on to another agreement, who amongst the following were signatories to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or also known as the JCPOA. The JCPOA is also known as the Iran nuclear deal. This landmark nuclear deal signed in 2015 brought the tensions between US and Iran to an end. 
See, for many years, US has opposed Iran's nuclear weapons program. It has even targeted Iran's nuclear weapons program through covert operations by working with Israel. It has been reported that US and Israel and their intelligence agencies have assassinated Iranian nuclear scientists. They even came up with a computer malware known as Tuxnet to wage a cyber war against Iran to destroy the nuclear centrifuges of Iran through cyber warfare, through, through remote access. They tried to destroy Iran's nuclear centrifuges through a computer worm known as Tuxnet. Right? These are the reports, these are the allegations against US and Israel. Then they also tried to counter Iran's nuclear weapons program by placing economic sanctions against Iran. Is that clear? So all these activities of US and Israel had increased the tensions between US and Iran and the two countries were headed towards a war between 2010 and 2014. During this period, tensions were very high between US and Iran. At any point, a war could have broken out. India was very much affected during this period because the US was expecting India to abide by these sanctions. But back then, India refused to follow the sanctions because Iran was a key supplier of oil to India. In Iran at that point was the second largest supplier of oil to India. Plus Iran was strategically very, very important to India because of the projects that we were looking at, the Chabahar port project, if you remember, right? For India to access Afghanistan and Central Asia, Iran was crucial and we were executing important projects. Keeping all these factors in mind, India refused to follow the American sanctions and we continued trading with Iran. Then as the tensions increased and as US-Iran were headed towards a war, finally mediation took place. European powers especially, they stepped in, they mediated between US and Iran and they worked out the landmark Iran nuclear deal or the JCPOA which was signed in 2015. This agreement was signed between Iran, US and a few European countries. Okay, It includes the P5 countries of the UN Security Council, that is the five permanent members, Russia, China, UK, France and US. Germany was also part of the deal, Iran and the European Union. Saudi Arabia was not part of this agreement. Okay, So 1, 2, 3 and 5, option C is the correct answer. This deal was worked out between the P5 plus 1 countries, then European Union and Iran. These were the parties to the Iran nuclear deal. P5 refers to the five permanent members of the Security Council. Plus one refers to Germany. And EU and Iran were part of the deal. This topic is recently in news as well. Because Donald Trump withdrew the US from the deal in 2018. In 2018, Donald Trump withdrew US from the deal and reimposed sanctions against Iran. With this reimposition, tensions have again increased and India has been brought under significant pressure to cut off oil imports from Iran. Is that clear? This time, India fell under American pressure and we zeroed out oil imports from Iran. Last year especially, when Donald Trump was contesting the presidential elections, he was consistently speaking against Iran and he had increased the sanctions against Iran. Iran was trying to retaliate and Iran violated the terms of the deal and it went ahead to enrich uranium, which today has brought Iran closer to a nuclear weapon. In the last few months, Iran has deliberately violated the nuclear deal to put pressure on the US because Iran wants the sanctions to be lifted. So to put pressure on the Trump government and as well as the current Biden administration, Iran and its parliament, they adopted a resolution to violate the nuclear deal and they started enriching uranium again so that they could get closer to a nuclear bomb. So that is why the topic was in news. In the last few weeks as well, there have been several articles and reports on this and that is why JCPOA can be important. The next question, what does the New START treaty deal with? Does it deal with greenhouse gas emissions? Or is it a nuclear arms reduction treaty between US and Russia? Is it a trade deal between China and US to end their trade wars? Or does it deal with renewable energy targets 
proposed by India under the International Solar Alliance? The correct answer is option B. START stands for Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Okay, it's essentially a arms reduction treaty. It's a nuclear arms reduction treaty signed between the United States and Russia. See, US and Russia, then US and Soviet Union, they have signed several arms reduction treaties in the past to prevent a nuclear war taking place between them. When the Cold War was at its peak in the 1970s, okay, they signed the ABM treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Because see, at one point, both US and Soviet Union, they had accumulated thousands of nuclear warheads and nuclear launch vehicles. This was a grave threat to global security. One misunderstanding could have triggered a nuclear war, especially in the Cold War era. Right? The suspicion was very high. So to bring down the suspicion and to provide for arms reduction, to reduce the nuclear stockpile, right? they started working towards many arms reduction treaties. One such treaty was the ABM or the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty signed in 1971-72, which became effective in 1972. This expired in 2002 when the US withdrew from the treaty. Okay? Then the second one, was the INF Treaty, which became effective in 1988. Please make a correction here. It's not 1998. This is incorrect. There's a typo mistake here. Correct this, it's 1988. In 1988, INF Treaty was brought in place. It deals with intermediate range nuclear missiles. Basically, the short range and intermediate range nuclear missiles were covered under the INF Treaty. Now, this treaty is very important for your exams. Because recently in 2019, Donald Trump withdrew the US from this treaty as well. So Trump has withdrawn US from quite a lot of treaties and conventions. And one of them is the INF Treaty. So INF expired in 2019 with the withdrawal of the US. Okay, This was the second arms reduction treaty. The third one is the START-1 treaty signed in 1991 and became effective in 1994. START stands for Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. It basically restricted the number of nuclear warheads, nuclear weapons and the launch vehicles that US and Russia were allowed to hold. This was effective until 2009. Then we had something known as the SORT Treaty, Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty. It dealt with strategic offensive weapons like nuclear weapons. It became effective in 2003 and expired in 2011. The SORT expired in 2011 because it was superseded by the new START treaty which replaced the START treaty. Okay? The new START was signed in 2010-2011, became effective in 2011 and it expired this year. The new START treaty was supposed to expire this year. But recently both the countries have agreed to extend the treaty until 2026. Is that clear? Please write this down. Very, very important. That is why the New START Treaty was in news. It was supposed to expire this year, but both US and Russia have extended it until 2026. Okay? So the arms reduction treaties between US and Russia are important. Next, what best describes China's debt trap diplomacy? It is an aggressive style of diplomacy adopted by Chinese diplomats in the 21st century. This is not the right answer. This is a description of China's wolf warrior diplomacy. Wolf warrior diplomacy of China refers to the aggressive behavior of Chinese diplomats. Of late, especially the new batch of Chinese diplomats, right, in the last 15-20 years, they have been trained from the beginning to be extremely aggressive in their conduct, in their negotiations. This term, wolf warrior, is derived from a popular Chinese action movie known as Wolf Warrior. So China has adopted this aggressive style of diplomacy. Their diplomats are displaying it as well. And this description refers to that. It refers to Wolf Warrior diplomacy, not to debt trap diplomacy. Next, series of strategic projects designed to encircle and contain India. This is also incorrect. That is not the description of debt trap diplomacy. 
this description refers to the string of pearls strategy of china which has been designed reportedly to encircle and contain india for example around india china has invested in strategic projects like the gwadar port in pakistan the kyokfu port in myanmar the hambantota port in sri lanka like this china has made several strategic investments across the indian ocean and experts believe that this is a part of china's so called strategy known as the string of pearl strategy to encircle and contain india so this is also not the correct description of debt trap diplomacy next is it mega connectivity and infrastructure projects around the world being funded by china this is also incorrect because this description refers to belt and road initiative or the one belt one road project of china through which it is funding infrastructure projects around the world to connect china with many other asian countries and african and european countries right belt and road initiative includes a land component where china is building road and rail projects it also has a sea based component the maritime component so this is also a incorrect description of debt trap diplomacy let's look at the last one is it china's reported strategy of offering loans on terms that end up being too difficult for countries to repay eventually compelling them to accept political or economic concessions this is the correct description of china's debt trap diplomacy it's believed that china provides very attractive and concessional loans to small developing underdeveloped nations in asia and africa reportedly china invests in such projects which are bound to fail commercially take for example the hambantota port of sri lanka according to this theory it it is said that china deliberately picks out such financially commercially unviable projects invests in them by providing cheap attractive loans to the small countries finally the project will fail and the country won't be able to repay the loan that is when china steps in and seeks political economic concessions from the other country from countries such as sri lanka what kind of concession china will try to ask for a long term lease over these projects it will push the small country to hand over the project which will have strategic value as well and a chinese company will take over the project on lease on a long term lease that's exactly what happened with the hambantota port of sri lanka the project failed as it was anticipated it was a commercial failure but hambantota is located in a very strategic location in the southern part of sri lanka i'll show the location as well in a later question so sri lanka couldn't repay the loans eventually it fell under the debt burden or the debt trap of china finally china acquired a 99 year lease to manage and control the hambantota port so the fears of countries like us and india is that through debt trap diplomacy china is making or seeking political economic concessions which have strategic significance the fear is that some day china will turn these facilities these commercial strategic facilities into a possible military facility okay so this is china's debt trap diplomacy option d is the correct answer next question which of the following cities are located in afghanistan we had to pick this question because of the latest developments in afghanistan plus it also gives you an idea about the type of questions the kind of questions upsc tends to ask in prelims okay there are few cities listed we have to check whether they are located in afghanistan herat kunduz mazar e sharif zahedan let's look at the map of afghanistan so that it's easier to answer the question all these cities were recently in news they are frequently reported for example herat kandahar mazar e sharif kunduz right jalalabad kabul thora bora all these locations are always in news these are the locations present in afghanistan okay whereas zahedan on the other hand is a iranian city located along the iran afghanistan border remember we had covered this when we spoke about the chabahar port project and the chabahar zahedan railway line we saw that zahedan is a a city in iran located on the iran afghanistan border whereas the other cities are located in afghanistan kandahar for example is the 
primary hub of the Taliban, right? Then Kabul is the capital of Afghanistan where the latest crisis took place. And before the Taliban took over Afghanistan, they captured all the key centers, including Herat, Mazar-e Sharif, Kunduz, Jalalabad, and the others. Okay? India had an embassy in Kabul, and we had four consulates one at Herat, one at Mazar e Sharif, one at Jalalabad, and one at Kandahar. We have shut down all these consulates along with the embassy because of Taliban's takeover of the country. Okay? The Tora Bora region is also important. It's a mountainous region, the Tora Bora Mountains. This is where Al Qaeda and Taliban took shelter back in 2001 when the US carried out an invasion after the 9 11 attacks. Right? Leaders of Al Qaeda like Osama bin Laden and the top leaders of Al Qaeda, they largely took shelter in the Tora Bora mountain range present along the Afghanistan Pakistan border. Pakistan is known to provide great support to Taliban and Al Qaeda along this belt, along the Durand line. And here you can even see Quetta, the capital of Balochistan. This is where the Taliban leadership was protected safely by Pakistan's ISI when the US carried out an invasion of Afghanistan. Okay, Quetta is also in news. This is where the Taliban was headquartered until recently before they took over Afghanistan. Right? So please be familiar with all these important cities and locations can be important for prelims. Next, another map based question. Which of the following are incorrectly matched? Okay, please pay attention. It is asking for incorrectly matched pairs. On one hand, we have oil and gas fields and it has been matched with few countries. We have to check whether they are correct and identify the incorrectly matched pairs. Farzad B gas field matched with Turkmenistan. Sakahalim gas field matched with Iran, Orinoco belt matched with Venezuela. See, all these oil and gas fields are very important. They are always in news and they are linked with India. Because see, India is trying to diversify its energy sources. We are trying to source energy from many other parts of the world to reduce our dependency on West Asia. So OVL or ONGC Videsh Limited has invested in several oil and gas fields, including the Farsad B gas field, Sakahalin and Orinoco belt. But let's see where they are located. The Farsad gas fields are located in Iran. It was recently in news because Iran has dropped India. It has dropped OVL out of this project. OVL had invested in the Farsad B gas field, but it has been dropped by Iran. Next here, look at the map of Venezuela. Orinoco is an important river. In Venezuela, in this river basin, there are massive oil and gas reserves. It is said, it is estimated that Venezuela has the highest reserves of oil in the world, even more than Saudi Arabia and any other country. Venezuela is said to have the world's largest reserves of crude oil. So this is the Orinoco belt correctly matched with Venezuela. Sakhalin gas fields belong to Russia. It's located towards the Siberia region, towards the Far East region of Russia. You can see the Pacific Ocean, the Sea of Japan over here. That is where the Sakhalin gas reserves are located. Okay. Now coming back to the question, Farzad B is incorrectly matched. It's not Turkmenistan. It's, it's supposed to be Iran. Sakhalin is not Iran. It's supposed to be Russia. So only Orinoco belt has been correctly matched with Venezuela. Okay. But question is asking for incorrectly matched pairs. So option B is the right answer, one and two only. We have a few more questions left. We'll try to cover all of them. Even though we are extending the session by a few minutes, we'll try to wrap up all the other questions that are there. What does the Northern Ireland Protocol recently seen in news refer to? Is it a treaty between UK and Northern Ireland to tackle Irish insurgency? Agreement to reunite Northern Ireland with Republic of Ireland? Arrangement between UK and France to settle their EEZ dispute, agreement to prevent border controls along the land border between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland following Brexit. See, this protocol, the Northern Ireland protocol, has been recently in news and it is related to Brexit. Option D is the right answer. Brexit, the Brexit referendum, was held in 2016, right? The people of Britain, they voted to quit or exit, Brit or, or exit the European Union. 
they voted to exit the EU, the regional grouping. So that's why Brexit, Britain's exit from EU. As Britain exited from EU, there was a need for a deal. An exit deal was required to facilitate the exit process. In order to minimize the impact on European economy and global economy, Britain had to work out an exit deal to smoothly withdraw from the European Union. Right? Now, before we proceed, we should also know about the geography of this region. See, when we say Britain or United Kingdom, we are referring to the sovereign government which has jurisdiction over four countries. That includes Wales, England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. These four countries come together to form the United Kingdom or Britain. Right? It includes Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales. So these are the countries, part of UK or Britain, which were exiting the EU. But Northern Ireland is very closely related to Republic of Ireland, which is another country. This is Republic of Ireland. Republic of Ireland continues to remain a member of the European Union. Is that clear? The people of Ireland, the Irish people, be it Northern Ireland or Republic of Ireland, they are very closely connected to each other. The Irish people have close cultural connections. In fact, Northern Ireland has always resisted the UK. Between 1960s and 1990s, Irish nationalists had even led a violent insurgent struggle against Britain to liberate Northern Ireland from UK. This insurgency was brought to an end by signing the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. By signing the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Now, there were fears that if Britain is exiting EU and if border controls come back between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland, it might again trigger Irish nationalist sentiments. Because see, under the European Union, there is a free trade area, right? There are no border controls. Border controls are abolished under the EU. That is the purpose. You, there, there are no visa restrictions. People can easily move from one EU member state to another. There are no restrictions on goods, services, investments. They can all free. They, they can all move freely across the borders, and there are no border controls, no customs, no immigration, no checkpoints. But when Britain leaves the EU, there was a need for a border control between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. This led to fears that if border controls come back, right, then it will affect the trade and the well-being of the Irish people in Northern Ireland. This might trigger the nationalist feelings again, lead to insurgency and threaten the stability of Britain. To prevent this from happening, Britain and EU, they worked out the Northern Ireland protocol. According to the protocol, they haven't put up border controls over here. They haven't brought up any border control between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. This border will be free. People and goods can freely move around. The border controls will come up over here. Goods which will move from Britain towards Northern Ireland, right? They will be checked over here. The checkpoints, the custom points, immigration checks will come over here. So politically, Northern Ireland will be out of the EU. It will be part of the UK. But however, economically speaking, with regard to trade relations, Northern Ireland will continue to remain a part of the free trade area. Is that clear? There won't be any border controls over here. And from Northern Ireland, people and goods can move across the border into Republic of Ireland. The border controls will come over here because the Britain, the rest of Britain has exited the European Union. So the protocol, the Northern Ireland protocol is related to this. It's related to the prevention of border controls along the borders between Northern and Republic of Ireland following Brexit. So option D is the correct answer. Next question. ECT or the East Container Terminal Project was recently in news and it is related to the affairs of which country? Maldives, Seychelles, Sri Lanka, Mauritius. The correct answer is option C, Sri Lanka. See, Sri Lanka has many important port facilities. It has many strategic ports. For example, the Hambantota port, which we spoke about. It's located over here in the southern part of Sri Lanka. It, it is a part of China's Belt and Road Initiative and believed to be a part of China's string of pearls. 
designed to encircle India. It's, it also fell victim to China's debt trap diplomacy. Okay, so China has got a long-term lease over the Hambantota port. The other ports include the Kake Senturai port near the Jaffna Peninsula. This port has been rebuilt by India because it was destroyed by the civil war between the Tamil minorities and the Sinhala Buddhist majority. It was also damaged during the 2004 tsunami. So India rebuilt the Kake Senturai port. Then we have the Trinko Malay port, strategically very important, very important for oil shipments between West Asia and uh, Southeast Asia. Here there were many oil farms that were coming up and India wanted to invest in these oil farms. But recently India was taken off this project. Okay, When the Rajapaksa brothers came back to power, Gotbaya Rajapaksa and Mahinda Rajapaksa, right? they are generally seen as pro-China leaders. Because uh, one decade ago, Mahinda Rajapaksa was the president and uh, his brother Gotbaya Rajapaksa was the defense minister. Even then, the Rajapaksa government had taken many decisions against India and it had largely favored China when it came to strategic and commercial projects. Right now, the Rajapaksa brothers are back. They are back in power. Gotbaya Rajapaksa is the president this time and Mahinda Rajapaksa has become the PM, the prime minister. India was supposed to take up few important projects, including the oil farm project at Trinko Malay. But the Rajpaksa brothers, after they came to power, they have cancelled the project and taken the project away from India. Okay, that's one development. Next, you see the Colombo port over here, a very important strategic port. This port has been largely developed by China. China has made massive investments at the Colombo port. It even runs most of the terminals at the Colombo port. Right next to these Chinese built terminals, a new terminal was coming up known as the East Container Terminal Project. This project was handed over to India and Japan by the previous Sri Lankan government. Previously, Maitripala Sirisena was the president who was largely friendly towards India. Under his government, the East Container Terminal Project was given to India and Japan as a part of the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor that India and Japan are developing as a counter to China's Belt and Road Initiative. India and Japan are working together on the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. They are trying to build connectivity between Asia and Africa as a counter to China's BRI. This project was supposed to be executed by India and Japan. But at the last minute, the project was cancelled and taken away from India and Japan. So this led to a, a controversy between India and Sri Lanka. That is why the East Container Terminal project was in news. So option C, Sri Lanka, is the correct answer. Next question, which of the following are correctly matched? On the left, we have a list of terrorist extremist groups and they have been matched with the countries or regions where they might be operating. So we have to check whether they are correctly matched. Hamas has been matched with Gaza Strip. ISIS-K matched with Kurdistan. Hezbollah matched with Lebanon. Okay. See, we have already spoken about Hamas and Hezbollah. Hamas is an extremist organization. Many countries label it as a terrorist outfit. It operates out of the Gaza Strip in the Palestine region. right? And it is seeking to liberate Palestine from Israel. It is seeking to establish Palestine as an independent nation. So it's a Palestinian extremist outfit. So the first one is correctly matched. Next is ISIS-K or isis Khorasan. This group is frequently in news because of its major terror attacks in Afghanistan. Even before the Taliban took over, ISIS-K was carrying out many major terror attacks in Afghanistan. Just a few months back, a Gurudwara in Kabul was attacked and many Sikh members were killed in this terror attack. Then after the Taliban took over, there was a major attack at the Kabul airport. Hundreds of people were killed, including American soldiers. All these terror attacks in Afghanistan have been claimed by ISIS-K or the isis Khorasan. This is seen as one of the branches of Islamic State. See, Islamic State, ISIS or ISIL or Daesh, it is largely centered around Iraq and Syria. But it has got many branches, affiliates around the world. One of them is ISIS-K or isis Khorasan operating along the Afghanistan-Pakistan belt. So second one is incorrect. It's not Kurdistan. 
because the curd region where the curd community can be found this region is found around turkey syria iran and iraq in between these countries is where you find the curd people the curd community which is fighting for a nation known as kurdistan so isis k is incorrectly matched it should have been matched with afghanistan next hezbollah hezbollah is a militant organization sponsored by iran against israel and it operates out of lebanon which is a neighboring country of israel both hamas and hezbollah were also in news because of the latest clashes between israel and hamas when the latest violence took place in israel and palestine hezbollah launched attacks from lebanon hamas launched attacks against israel from the gaza strip so both 1 and 3 are correctly matched option c is the right answer next question the term ifc ior sometimes seen in news refers to it refers to the information fusion center for the indian ocean region ifc stands for information fusion center for the indian ocean region it's an initiative of the indian navy which provides for monitoring the shipping traffic in the indian ocean region is that clear that is what ifc ior stands for see in order to strengthen india's coastal and maritime security india has executed the coastal surveillance radar project after the 2611 attacks our coastal security was exposed so to strengthen our coastal and maritime security india launched the ambitious coastal surveillance radar project under this india installed a series of radars all across india's coastline including the island territories of lakshadweep and andaman nicobar islands so this was phase 1 of the coastal surveillance radar project then after this was successfully established the project has been extended under phase 2 to friendly countries such as mauritius seychelles at these countries the coastal radars built by india have been inaugurated and we are also planning to extend them into maldives and sri lanka is that clear this is the second phase of the project these radars will monitor the shipping traffic in the region provide this information in real time so this is very valuable intelligence maritime intelligence and all the data the radar data would be collated and integrated into a national headquarters located at gurugram this national command center is the ifc ior the information fusion center for indian ocean region which is operated by the indian navy which you can see over here in this image right this is the national command center for this project at this location at this headquarters you will get a complete real time picture of the shipping traffic in the indian ocean right it is of great significance for coastal and maritime security that's why many foreign countries are also interested in participating in this initiative friendly navies from us australia japan then france then even russia they are all posting their liaison officers from their navies to work with the indian navy they are deploying their liaison officers to work at the information fusion center for the indian ocean region which is the headquarters of the coastal surveillance radar project right it provides for integrated view of the shipping traffic of the entire ior region it's a strategic project for india helps counter chinese influence and deal with many other security threats and friendly navies are also very interested and they are working with the indian navy at this center so coming back to the question what is ifc ior the correct answer obviously is option b it is india's information management center for maritime security okay coming to the next question consider the following pairs agalega islands matched with seychelles assumption island matched with mauritius feodu finolu island matched with maldives which of them are correctly matched option a is the right answer only the third one has been correctly matched remember when we spoke about maldives and a project of india in maldives we discussed the feodu finolu island which maldives had leased to china so third one is correctly matched but the first and second have been interchanged Agalega Islands belongs to Mauritius Assumption Island belongs to Seychelles Please look at the map 
Agalega Islands over here belongs to Mauritius. Assumption Island closer to East Africa belongs to Sessions. These two islands are in news, very important to India, because in 2015, Prime Minister Modi visited these countries and announced the launch of the Sagar Doctrine of India. This is the Doctrine of India towards the Indian Ocean region. Sagar stands for security and growth for all in the region. During this visit, the Prime Minister also inaugurated the coastal surveillance radars that we had built on Seychelles and Mauritius. These radars were inaugurated by the Prime Minister. During this visit, Seychelles and Mauritius agreed to lease two important strategic islands to India to create infrastructure on these islands. Mauritius signed an agreement with India to lease the Agalega Islands. Seychelles leased the Assumption Islands to India. Strategic experts believe that India is likely to develop military facilities, military infrastructure on these islands. But India, Mauritius and Seychelles deny the reports. They say that they are only building transport infrastructure for strengthening the economy of these islands. But China, other major powers and many experts believe that India will turn these commercial facilities into possible military facilities for the Indian Navy and the Indian Armed Forces. Okay? Then also note, in the same map you can see the Diogo Garcia Island, which is a British Indian Ocean Territory. It is owned by Britain. Britain has sovereignty over Diego Garcia. It has leased the island to US, which has set up a major military naval base at Diego Garcia. The US operates a major military naval base from the Diego Garcia island, which belongs to Britain. Okay, these are some important locations in the Indian Ocean region. Now we have come to the last question of the series of the IR sessions. There is a description provided we have to check whether it matches with any of these foreign policy initiatives of India. The initiative aims to explore the multifaceted Indian Ocean world by collating archaeological and historical research in order to document the diversity of cultural, commercial and religious interactions in the Indian Ocean. It also tries to understand how the knowledge and manipulation of the monsoon winds have shaped interactions across the Indian Ocean and led to the spread of shared knowledge systems, traditions, technologies and ideas along the maritime routes. This description, this paragraph above refers to which of India's foreign policy initiatives? Is it the Sagar Doctrine, Project Mossum, Project Sagar Mala or none of the above? The correct answer is option B, Project Mossum. See, Sagar Doctrine is India's foreign policy doctrine towards the Indian Ocean region. The Sagar Mala project is about developing India's port infrastructure, right? Whereas Project Mossum has been launched by the Ministry of Culture along with the Archaeological Survey of India. This is a soft power initiative of India which also has a strategic dimension. Under this initiative, that is Project Mossum, India is trying to study the impact of monsoon winds which were acting as trade winds in the ancient medieval times. Just look at this map. In the ancient medieval times, India had become the center, the fulcrum of the Indian Ocean with regard to trade. Because back then, the boats, the ships, they were using the trade winds, the monsoon winds to move from Southeast Asia to West Asia, from Africa to Asia. So all the countries, all the then kingdoms and empires which were trading with each other, they would rely upon India. India was at the center of the Indian Ocean region. The trade back then was guided by the monsoon winds, the monsoon trade winds. So this economic and cultural exchange of the ancient medieval times has led to great interactions between the people of this region. There has been exchange of ideas, exchange of culture, right? So we share a historical relationship, a civilizational relationship with most of these regions. Be it the Arab traders, be it traders from Indonesia, be it from Africa. India had connections with all of them. Indian traders used to sell their product, their produce over here. They would get products from these regions. So there is a historical civilizational link between India and these countries especially the, the littoral countries of Indian Ocean, which were dependent on the monsoon trade winds. 
So India is trying to study those links, revive that cultural heritage and understand the impact of the monsoon trade winds on the geopolitics of this region. Right? It's a soft power initiative led by the Ministry of Culture and Archaeological Survey of India, but it also has a strategic dimension. It will help us revive our cultural links with these countries and it will help India to counter the rising influence of China in the Indian Ocean. That is why Project Mossum is seen as an important initiative. Okay? So this initiative is also frequently in news and hence can be important for your prelims. So with this, we have completed the IR module under the crash course. In these three sessions, we have covered more than 120 topics by using around 85 to 90 practice questions. I really hope the sessions have been useful. I hope it really helps you in your examination. Please let me know how the classes went in the comment section below. Don't forget to like the videos and please subscribe to the channel. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. Good night.